Georg Hegel was one of the greatest philosophers in the German idealist tradition, and he is remarkable in philosophy because he is the last of the great system builders. Since Hegel's demise, no one has taken up the mantle or has taken up the challenge of trying to include all of reality and all of existence in one comprehensive system. So even if Hegel fails in his attempt to create a completely comprehensive account of the human condition, you have to give him a certain degree of credit for trying what may be impossible. He is trying to construct a coherent uh, explanation or account of the external world of nature, the internal world of consciousness and experience, and the process by which the by which consciousness develops in historical time. So what he does is take the idealist tradition that comes from Greece into the Enlightenment and historicizes it and tries to construct a system around that historical development of the human mind or the human psyche or as he would put it, the Geist. Now before I go any further, it's worth noting that Hegel's original training, his original education was in theology. And for those of you who find Hegel very difficult reading, like me, I mean, Hegel is very difficult reading, the easiest access, the best entree to Hegel's writings uh, would be, can be found in his early theological writings. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I had a particularly difficult time trying to get my way through the phenomenology and through the philosophy of right and through uh, some other of Hegel's writings. And I went to a professor of philosophy and I said, Professor, I know what these words mean specifically and individually in English and when I go back to the German. I know what these individual words mean. But when I put them into these 100 or 120 word sentences, I have no idea what I'm being told. It becomes opaque to me and I can't get through it. In other words, I just don't have the mental power to figure out what's going on here. Is it me or is it Hegel? And he said, go to the early theological writings, particularly for those of you with a background in theology. It will make a great deal of Hegel's subsequent work more transparent. It at least connects you to a book you might know, the Bible. And when you can get a sense of Hegel's peculiar readings of something like that, his typical or characteristic intellectual moves, it will eventually make the rest of his work more accessible. So just a help to those of you that actually want to follow the path into the Hegelian writings. Start with his early work, his theological writings. That's the best way to handle it. Um, at the end of the lecture, I'd like to discuss the influence of theology on Hegel and whether this is theological or anti-theological, arguably the most difficult problem in deciding what to make of his philosophy. A second point that should be made early on in any lecture on Hegel is about thesis, synthesis, and antithesis. Everybody talks about this in every book on Hegel. Forget it. I mean, it's there. It occasionally crops up in Hegel's writings, but it is not a dominant element in his work. Triads are dominant. In other words, three of everything. If Hegel writes about any given thing, he will split it into three parts and three component parts and three parts of that and three parts of that on ad infinitum until he runs out of ink. His typical intellectual move is to break things into three parts. And I guess you can go back and in a Procrustean way kind of force this into that thesis-antithesis mold. And perhaps that's a fair reading of Hegel, but he doesn't himself explicitly use this thesis-antithesis-synthesis model, or at least explicitly so. So I'd say the triads are more important, breaking things up into threes, than the overemphasis on this thesis-antithesis-synthesis. Now, in order to talk about Hegel, I have to drop back to Kant. As is the case with all of 19th century German philosophy, they are all standing in the shadow of Kant. And the erosion of the Kantian synthesis, the uh, breakup of Kantian, uh, particularly Kant's understanding of the Ding an sich, is the source of the most important and fruitful developments in early 19th century German philosophy. It's the breakup of Kantianism that generates German idealism. Here I'm thinking about Fichte and Schelling in particular, but also as the final stage in that, Hegel. And of course there are three of them. All right. Let's think about the problem of uh, consciousness. That's a big Kantian issue. And Kant said that we can't know the ding an sich. In other words, we can't know things in themselves. We only know the external phenomenal world as it is mediated by the a priori forms of cognition. Those of you that have some knowledge about this understand that 
the a priori forms are the necessary intermediaries between us and the real external world. The ding on sich, things in themselves, are accessible to the mind of God in Kant's view, but not accessible to our understanding because we must experience the world as individuals experience it. So instead of experiencing the podium directly, the, the ding on sich, I experience the podium through the lens or through the form of space, time, causality, number, being, negation, all that kind of business. Here's a problem that emerges, and the early idealists, Fichte and Schelling in particular, latch on to this, and this is going to be the basis of their criticism of Kant. They say, look, Professor Kant, you have told us that two of the a priori forms of human cognition are being and negation, right? They're built right into the human psyche. And you say that these a priori forms prevent us from getting direct, unmediated access to the ding an sich, that, which means essentially the ding an sich, the thing in itself, is unknowable. If it is unknowable, how can you attribute, it, attribute the predicate of being to it? In other words, how do you know they are at all? If we can't know the thing in itself, then how do we know that there is a thing in itself? And the answer is, if you stop and think about Kant's delimiting of the possible scope of human knowledge, it is simply not possible to have grounds for saying that there exists a ding on sich. So what the great idealists, particularly uh, Fichte and Schelling, do is say, we have to get rid of this ding on sich. Now that sounds easy, and it sounds like it's not too much of a problem, but actually this generates an intractable and very difficult set of philosophical problems. And it's, it's a labor even for me to get across to you what the problem would be. So I mean, bear with me as we kind of have a small excursus here. We have this podium, and I'm perceiving it through the forms of cognition, the a priori forms. And apparently, that's the only way I can experience the world, and I can never get access to this ding on sich. Fichte and Schelling say, well, I have no grounds for believing that the content of the world is out there, and I merely formulate it. In other words, if you think about the a priori forms of human cognition and their relation to the ding on sich, they relate to each other as content relates to form. The content of our experience is these dingen an sich, or if you want to take the whole world as one big ding on sich, Right? That's the content of human experience. The form is the a priori categories of thought. We take this stuff and we sort of impose this kind of psychic cookie cutter on it. So they're all shaped sp using space and time and causality and number and being and negation and the rest of the categories. Now here's the problem. If we eliminate the ding on sich, then that means essentially that there's no external reality. In other words, the mind creates the form of human experience, but if there's no ding on zik to be formulated, no matter, no content, then that means that there is no external world, that the mind creates everything, both the content and the form of human cognition. And you see the difficulty there? Kant wanted to hold on to the idea of the ding on zik because it prevented him from falling back into a sort of idealistic solipsism. See the difficulty? Apparently not, so let me try it a little bit further. What we experience is a sort of content. It's out there, and we stick it into these forms, the a priori forms of cognition. If there is no ding on zik out there for us to formulate, then that means that we add to our experience not just the form, shape, time, number, causality, but also the stuff that is being formed. See how that makes sense? So what that means, this explains the transition from Kant's philosophy, which is sometimes described as a, as an, a sort of idealist philosophy, but I think it's a slight uh, mis uh, misstatement. I would say that Kant's philosophy is a critical philosophy that states what the limits of metaphysics are, what the limits of the human mind are, and it is not as explicitly wedded to idealism as Fichte and Schelling will become. It's by holding on to the ding on sich, holding on to an external reality, that Kant allows for there to be something else other than us, other than mind. So when Fichte and Schelling get rid of the ding on sich and Hegel, incidentally, wrote one of his early works on the idealism and the systems of Fichte and Schelling. The problem we're going to have is the problem that's native and intrinsic to all idealism, the problem of solipsism. It's bad enough that our, that our mind creates the form of consciousness. If it creates the content, too, then there's nothing out there besides us, and we're all alone here in this magical show, this set of experiences, and we create that. In other words, there's nothing external to us. It's just us. And perhaps not even us. It's probably just me. Right? I don't know about you people, right? In other words, I see you out there, but really you're no different phenomenally than chairs and tables, right? You make noise, you act in certain ways, and well, <laughs> no ding on zik. I'm creating you along with everything else, right? So the problem is that when we lose the ding on zik, either we get rid of, we junk the whole Kantian project, 
or we collapse into a radical kind of idealism. And all idealism has the same problem. I mean, certainly the same problem that emerges in Descartes. How do you know about this external world, or is there an external world? So this is the problem that Fichte and Schelling are formulate, formulate and never really get around. In other words, they see that the Ding an sich has to go, because by Kant's own understanding, by his own system, you can't attribute being to it. But if we don't know these, these ding, ding and an sich, if we can't attribute being to them, then we get just us. Mind creates both the form and the content of consciousness, and there's nothing external to it. Hegel wants to explain this and get us out of this terrible mess. And that's his problem. What he does is something like this. It's a very interesting maneuver. I don't know the extent to which it's successful, but it's certainly an intriguing thought. He says, yes, the world is a product of mind. Obviously, that's true. There is no ding on sich. The key thing is that you think it's the product of your little mind, don't you? Nay, your little mind and all this other stuff is the product of one big mind, a giant collective subject called the Geist. Now, Geist is a particularly difficult word because it doesn't have any translation into English. Whenever we translate Hegel into English, the best they can do is to, tr is to translate Geist as spirit or as mind. Those are the, the, tip, uh, the most typical translations. Neither of them work very well. And this is one of the difficult problems of moving from an untranslatable word around which Hegel's so si his system follows and trying to explain it to you. Best I can do is to show, why, first of all, why it is that they translated as spirit or mind. Um, it's something internal. It's something psychic. It's something non-material. It is somehow prior to material nature, to the external world. The difficulty with describing it as spirit, which is one translation, is that it has a sort of mystical resonance to it, a, a, an overtly religious resonance, which is not entirely misapplied, but gives one a sense that it's perhaps a little gooier than it need be. In other words, Geist is meant to be a little less mystical than our, the, our talk about spiritual things usually is. So, uh, Geist is meant to be quite concrete. In addition, when we try and translate Geist as mind, as in the Bailey translation of, uh, of the phenomenology, the problem is, is that mind just clearly doesn't work. It's very clear that some of the time he's not talking about mind when he's using the term Geist. So Bailey himself decides, you know, I'm going to have to get rid of that. I, he calls it the phenomenology of mind uh, in the title and then switches back and forth from spirit to mind to something else because nothing really translates this very well. So I think the best we can do Think a little bit about the etymology of the word and how it carries over into English. It gives you some idea of the, the connotations which are not irrelevant to this question. There are at least three English words that have the same root as geist. First one is ghost. And that would refer back to the spiritual element here. There's some ghostly, psychic, me mental attitude towards this or mental element in this. And the result is that you get a sense that this is somehow not material, right? that it is a ghost, but that by itself won't give you the whole idea because this is meant not just to be real, unlike ghosts, but ultimate reality, capital R reality, permanent truth. Another word that's connected with Geist is the idea of geyser. You know, like at Yellowstone Park, those things that regularly blow out that hot water? Well, if you think about the regularity and the periodic predictability of a geyser as a natural upwelling of something intrinsic and subterranean, it gives you some sense of what the geist is. In other words, there's some acorn that generates the oak of reality. There's something built into the geist which, by its very nature, explodes, generates up and out. It has its own internal force, and it operates by its own internal laws. So in some ways, the, the emergence of Geist is something regular and predictable and intrinsic to itself, like a geyser. Right? Just something to think about. And the final thing that's relevant, and this I think is the, the word that's most closely connected with Kegel's use of Geist, is our word gist, as in the gist of an argument, the essence of an argument. Do you get the gist of what I'm saying? That's very closely connected with Hegel's idea of Geist. The gist of an argument connected with the idea of a geyser, connected with the idea of a ghost, give you some of the connotations, some of the ideas when, uh, of what Geist means when you link it up with poor translations like spirit and mind. The difficulty with English is that it just doesn't translate certain German ideas very well. I mean, Heidegger's Dasein is another, because it doesn't translate. So, when you're working through this, always keep in mind the fact that you may, part of your difficulty in reading this may come from the fact that we don't have any one word that immediately accounts for what Geist is. And since Geist is the center of his system, you'll have to pay particular attention to that. Now, the problem of accounting for consciousness, 
in the absence of the Ding an sich, in the apparent absence of an external world, is what the phenomenology of Geist is all about. In other words, it's, a Hege it's an attempt at a Hegelian solution to a Kantian problem. And the problem is, how is it possible, or what intelligibility can be lent to the idea that mind creates everything? Well, once you lose the Ding an sich, then there is only mind generating the form and content of consciousness. But this mind is not static, as Kant would have us believe. Kant thinks that the a priori forms are built in, kind of hardwired into the psyche, and there's no choice. There's no change. There's no alteration. Hegel believes that the actual categories of human cognition develop over time. So there is a temporal dynamism here which allows for change and allows for the growth of consciousness. And by implication, this growth of consciousness is teleological. It goes from one point to another. It has a beginning point and has an end point. The opening point will turn out to be the finitude of consciousness. And the end point will turn out to be infinite consciousness. And this is the progress of the Geist through history. This development of consciousness is, in fact, the development of self-consciousness. Remember that there's nothing else besides yourself. You're generating the whole world. So what else could it be but the development of self-consciousness? Nothing else but you and your consciousness, or the consciousness of the Geist as a whole, and you are a small fragment of that. So what we are looking here at here in the phenomenology of Geist is, first of all, a phenomenology. Remember, when we, uh, or you can look forward to Husserl, the idea of a phenomenology means that appearance is reality. In other words, the world as we experience it is what it is. There's no ding on zik. There's no second level that we can't get access to. What this podium seems to be is exactly what this podium is. What human history on the development of the human psyche is, is the human psyche itself. There's nothing underneath or apart or separate from. The world is what it is. And if we look at it rationally, it will disclose itself rationally to us. This is why. Think about it. If the world is mind, or if reality is mind, or if reality is Geist, then naturally, since the content of mind or Geist is rationality, what could the world be but a rational process, assuming that it's temporal and dynamic and changes over time? So this is what the apparently very obscure and implausible proposition that the world is a rational process, that's what it means. In other words, the world is the development of mind, and the, and which means that mind is temporalized. What the phenomenology then turns out to be is a record or an interpretation or an analysis of the coming to be of the appearance of knowledge, the development of knowledge over time. So it's a philosophy of history, but it's also a kind of speculative psychology, a sort of philosophical psychology. In other words, Hegel constantly, I mean, first of all, uh, don't try this at home. In other words, if you are intending to read Hegel, I think that this is about the last thing you should read, not because it isn't a wonderful book, but because you just won't make any sense out of it as a beginning student of philosophy. After you've read all the other books that get covered in the course, then you may want to come back to Hegel, and then you'll have a very good time with it. But you'll find it very daunting and difficult if you try it first up. The reason why is that Hegel is arguably the best read I mean, guy that I cover in the course of the history of philosophy. In other words, he has an amazing encyclopedic mind. He is fluent in almost all disciplines. And it, when he is wrong, he is grandly wrong. But he has a magnificent mind. And there are very few people that, in addition to having great intellectual gifts, are as learned and as well read as Hegel. Um, the elusiveness of his book, the, the many allusions that he makes in passing, which he expects us to know, is one of the things that impede us from understanding the phenomenology. He's referring to just about everything in creation. Since he knows the entire history of Western philosophy and is well versed in Western art and Western religion and the whole kind of culture of the West, what he does then is look at these phases of culture historically and say to himself, what kind of spirit would hold such a belief as that? And how long would they hold it for? And why would they hold it? And why would they give it up? In other words, is it really arbitrary and contingent? Is it a random set of changes that the history of philosophy undergoes? Or is there something unifying it, something that holds it together? And Hegel says, yes, that is exactly what it is. The whole history of philosophy is the coming to self-knowledge of the Geist. And, what it, and it comes to this knowledge starting with just the external world and its own understanding and comprehension of that world, and moves in a gradual dialectical progression, generating contradictions and generating impasses. And these contradictions and impasses turn out to be fruitful because they, by creating an impasse, they ratchet consciousness up, ratchet the Geist up into its next level. The finitude and limitation of human self-consciousness or human self-understanding gradually progresses 
through the process of contradiction to ever higher levels. And the end, the telos, the purpose of these cogitations is to, com to complete uncontradictory and absolute final self-consciousness. This can be viewed as the reconciliation of God and man, or the reconciliation of human beings with themselves, depending on what sort of a reading, the right wing or the left wing reading you're going to give it. I'll discuss that a little bit later. But the idea here is that Hegel is describing the spiritual odyssey of Western man. And because Hegel believes that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, he is also talking about his own spiritual odyssey from an early, naive, pre-philosophical view to the position he finds himself in at the end of his life where he believes, perhaps mistakenly, that the entire history of Western thought leads up to him and his writing desk. There's a line, I believe it's in the encyclopedia, where he says, uh, my pen is writing the thoughts of God. Well, that doesn't, it's not so far-fetched since, after all, the Geist is becoming self-conscious and the cutting edge of time is right here and now and it turns out to be him. So one of the difficulties of all philosophers of history is that they necessarily view the world as if it led up to them where else could it lead? All right. So that's one of the difficulties, the kind of tendency towards omniscience that we see in Hegel. It's built into this kind of a project about the history of philosophy. You could read the phenomenology of Geist as being what the Germans called a Bildungsroman, a novel of development or a novel of maturation. This is the way the big collective subject, the big person, the big mind, the big Geist, turns into what it necessarily had to be. Built into Hegel's conception is the, is the Aristotelian idea of entelechy. Entelechy means natural purpose. Acorns naturally want to be oaks. Right? Babies naturally want to be adults. The Geist naturally wants to be completely omniscient, completely self-conscious. And since it generates the entire world, when it is completely conscious of itself, it is completely conscious of everything that it can be conscious of. It is essentially divine. It is the mind of God. So you can see the echoes of that early religious training here in this longing for final knowledge, in this desire for God's omniscience. And Hegel, alas, couches this in very difficult prose, but many of the ideas are quite subtle and well thought out. And if you can hack your way through this book, you will find it extremely rewarding. Now let's think about, let's take this apart a little bit further. Since reality is constructed by mind, or Geist, we don't have a ding on Zick, that means that the real is rational, because mind is rational, or Geist is rational. And it's also the case that rationality is necessarily connected up with the idea of freedom. In other words, freedom and rationality are always coextensive. Think, go back to Kant. Think about the idea of autonomy. To be free is also to be rational, is also to be, also to be autonomous, if any of you know the uh, foundations of the metaphysics of morals. So for the whole German intellectual tradition, there is a connection that goes back to the early Greeks of freedom and rationality, and also freedom and teleology and rationality. In other words, this conception of reason not only tells us how the world works, but it also tells us why the world works that way. In other words, it tells us about purposes, not just events. It is normative, ultimately. So this is a special and ex an elaborate conception of rationality which allows us to discern purposes or ends within the world around us. Um, the process by which one contradiction is undermined by its alternative or its antithesis and turned into a third thing that collapses or and, and holds on to what is desirable and true in the earlier ideas is called, uh, in English it's, it's translated as sublation. But since no one uses that word in regular everyday English, give you an idea of what sublation means. In German, it's Aufhebung, which means to raise up. And there are lots of other different connected meanings to it. In other words, that's an everyday word in German. I mean, when you drop something on the floor, you hape it out. I mean, you, you pick it up. But beyond that, um, it also has connotations of cancellation, of destruction somehow. And it also is connotes a certain sense of preservation, of maintenance, of holding on to something, too. So because of this felicitous overlapping of ideas in German, Hegel gets a lot of mileage out of this. Now, uh, what goes on in the process of human history, then, is a process of this sublation, of keeping what is true in a, in a particular stage of human conscious development, moving on, finding the contradictions, thinking that, that stage through, reaching its limits, finding its contradictions and its flaws, and then keeping what's true, getting rid of the flaws, and moving on to a second, second stage of development, which answers those questions, which solves some of those problems, but which, alas, generates a new set of problems, 
We think our way through these new set of problems, we move up to the next stage. That is the sense in which this is dialectical. This is Geist talking to itself. There's nothing else to talk to. Of course it's talking to itself. It's the whole of reality. So what we have then is the gradual working out of contradictions, the bursting of the Brown's of finite understanding, and this process necessarily reaches its teleological end in infinitude, in the lack of contradictions, in kind of Parmenidean unity. So the process begins with sense and perception, and Hegel makes the argument, familiar to Kantians, that known objects presuppose knowing subjects, and the categories by which we know the world are objective, not subjective, and this is just the starting point of our knowledge of the world, because not only do we know this dead matter out here, we all, or if there is an out here, we also know other people, and we define our consciousness and we define our identity with regard to other people. And in many respects, this is the most entertaining and intriguing part of this book. It's called The Dialectic of Master and Slave. And this dialectic of master and slave is the one that's most influential in the Marxist readings of Hegel. And the idea is this, that in the, the earliest and most primitive stages of consciousness, some people are willing to risk their lives to dominate other people. And what they long for is not so much work from other people or kind of some kind of obedience, what they want is recognition. They want others to recognize their power. This is a very roundabout way of saying that identity is socially constructed. And that there is something built right into human beings, a sort of lust for power or domination, which has paradoxical effects. This is incidentally the generation of the, the beginning of history. In other words, when we move from our sense perception of the world to our attempt to dominate other people, that's the beginning of history. And it's also analogous in the Bible to the fall of man. It's the beginning of sin and the beginning of alienation from Marxists. Well, this dialectic of master and slave emerges. And what we get here is that some masters, people who are willing to put their life on the line and risk their life in order to dominate others, well, some of them are victorious and kill their opponents. And, some of, and the ones that are victorious get to lord it over all others. Those who don't want to risk their lives, who think this is a foolish project, they become slaves. They submit to the master. This happens all over the world. Here's the idea, and here's where the cunning of history comes in. By becoming a master, the master does not liberate himself. In fact, quite the opposite. He makes himself dependent upon the slave. By becoming enslaved, the slave does not become shackled to the master. In fact, he becomes free because he's the one that connects with nature and produces all the things that he needs and all the things that the master needs. In other words, the slave doesn't need the master. The master needs the slave. The one who's really enslaved is the master. It's a tremendous irony and it's a very powerful thought. He's right too. Right? You never see masters running away from their slaves. Right? And here, here's the reason why. Right? It's a deep thought. I mean, it's a tremendous insight. And the point here is that, ironically, the, the slave meets the negativity of nature and is forced to confront nature, develops his own skill, develops his own internal elements, and as a result, achieves as much liberation as is possible in that stage. This set of ironic contradictions, where the master is, <laughs> is dependent and the slave is free, this cunning of history, this terrible irony, generates another intriguing stage called the unhappy consciousness. The unhappy consciousness is the consciousness of the fact that we have not achieved the freedom we long for in this first phrase. And, they are and this, the unhappy consciousness attempts to achieve freedom by a combination of resignation and s dependence upon the self. In other words, don't depend upon slaves, don't depend upon others, don't depend upon the external world. What you can count on is you. And this, in the history of philosophy, is called Stoicism. It's a brilliant reading of Stoicism, particularly for those of you that know the history of philosophy, that are aware of the fact that in Roman philosophy, the two greatest Stoics are Epictetus and Aurelius, a master, an emperor, and a slave. Right? In other words, the elusiveness is what makes this so difficult. You have to know a lot about the history of philosophy before you can see what he's gesturing at is Aurelius and Epictetus. Right? So the next stage of the unhappy consciousness, or the first stage of the unhappy consciousness is Stoicism. The difficulty is, as the Romans quickly find out, that this is not a satisfactory solution either. We cannot completely depend upon ourselves unless we have real, solid, genuine knowledge about the world. But as if you look back at Marcus Aurelius, he's not quite sure if the gods exist or not, or if there's just nature, you know, atoms in the void. There are many things which perplex Aurelius, and he keeps on persuading himself that don't worry about it, just stick to your duty, stick to your duty, stick to your duty, and don't worry about that. And this is a man that obviously is worried about it, which is why he spends all his time reassuring himself. Well, the next phase, and you have to know a little bit more about Ro uh, the philosophy in Rome, um, the, the phase after Stoicism, when they take Stoicism to its logical extension, when you don't get that genuine knowledge, is called skepticism. 
And here I think he has in mind Lucian the skeptic. Right? You have to know a lot about the history of philosophy to know what Hegel is driving at. He assumes that you've read all this stuff before and can put it all together, all right? which tells you something about German high culture right at the time he was writing, an impressive set of achievements. So the next stage of the unhappy consciousness is skepticism, and skepticism just leads to despair. It leads to the internal breakup of Rome, no doubt, but as a, an element in the human psyche, if you take skepticism seriously and you take it the whole way, it's the end of speech, it's the end of thinking, it's the end of talking, the project of philosophy has failed. Human self-consciousness has come up to an, a, 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 a gap we can't bridge. This sets the stage for Christianity which is the religion of spirit. He says it's not an accident that what supersedes this is a universal gut religion in which Geist is recognized for the first time. The universality of humanity is recognized for the first time. But alas, it's not recognized in a philosophical way because Hegel holds the view that religion is a precursor to an early primitive pictorial form of philosophy. They agree in that they both re refer to uh, absolute spirit to parts of the, the, essential, the essential marrow of the Geist. But the point is that Christianity, or any religion, is necessarily a pictorial representation of Geist. It is not philosophy itself. It's just clear from Hegel's discussion of this why it is Christianity supersedes Roman skepticism and Stoicism. A very intriguing reading. You have to be impressed with that. Now, here he breaks off and moves into another section, and I guess I should point out here that although Hegel is a great, uh, a great idealist philosopher and a profound intellect, the Phenomenology of Mind is not a well-organized book. Remember that he was writing it just as Napoleon was coming through Jena, right, destroying the Holy Roman Empire, which had been around for the previous thousand years, and Hegel didn't even know if it was going to get to the publisher. He was mailing it off just as, you know, the uh, cannons are blowing up, and you know, houses are being torn down, and soldiers are coming through. So there is a, a rumor afloat that there's some deep structure here, and this is a terribly well-organized book. Actually, it's a wretchedly organized book. The difficulty is, is that while he was writing it under very, very difficult circumstances, the amazing thing is that he got it written at all. So from Christianity, he breaks off now into a section called Objective uh, Geist. And what Objective Geist is, is not the individual, but society and the, so and the social rules, the social organization of society. Like Kant, Hegel believes that there is no freedom without law. In other words, for Kant and Hegel, freedom is not the dubious and contingent freedom of, of uh, Robinson Crusoe, in order to be free, you have to be autonomous, autonomous, self-lawed. You have to create a set of rules for yourself and obey them and impose them on yourself. That is, for example, what the family does. That's the first stage in the development of objective geist. The second stage in the development after the family is civil society, another set of laws which control you. And the third and final stage is the state, which is why Hegel is often read as being a sort of state worshiper. In fact, he is just saying that this is the last stage in the development of objective spirit. It is necessary to the further development of human capacities, particularly the human capacity for self-knowledge. Now, art, at, when it's correlated with these changes in objective Geist, and this is one of the deepest points of Hegel, is a representation of the tension between these things. It's quite extraordinary. If any of you know Sophocles' play uh, Antigone, the conflict between Antigone and Creon is the conflict between the gods of the family, the first and earliest stage of objective Geist, and the laws of the state, the last development of objective Geist. In other words, these conflicts emerge not just in the history of politics, but also in the history of art, within the content of art itself. The later development of this conflict will be the conflict in, among the moderns between the individual and society. Go have a look at the sorrows of young Werther and see how the individual comes a cropper when he meets society. Think of how Werther gets turned out of the soiree that he wants to stay in. Art is also an element in absolute spirit. In other words, when we bring together uh, subjective spirit, and objective spirit, when we bring together these two elements of Geist, what we will get is what Hegel calls absolute spirit. And these are the realms in which human beings come to their highest peak of self-consciousness. And like everything else in Hegel, there are three parts of absolute spirit, art, religion, and philosophy. And I've always found this a very deep interpretation as well. In other words, I think that it is probably accurate to say that the greatest achievements of the human mind have been in the realm of art, religion, and philosophy. It is hard to think of anything that has greater consequence for us. So I think that while a good bit of this is Procrustean, and there are quite a few jumps and leaps to be made here, um, there is considerable insight to be gained if you will look at it in the right spirit. Now let's look at art, first of all. 
um, absolute spirit, the first stage of absolute spirit is art, and art itself goes through three phases, like everything else in Hegel. We've got the, the symbolic phase, primitive mimet mimetic gestures like cave painting, one would assume. Um, the symbolic phase, which or, or, uh, the symbolic is first, and then uh, the second is the classical phase. And the classical phase starts out with myths about the gods and ends up being ironic. The gods get shrunk down to human size. Those of you who know the history of Greek tragedy know what a deep interpretation this is. If you know the movement from Aeschylus, the, uh, the moral rigor and seriousness of the Oristia, to the gradual loss of that moral orientation that we begin to see in Sophocles, to the complete abandonment of it in Euripides. I mean, all of Euripides' characters are really neurotic, and he's, he's involved with the deus ex machina, and he doesn't take the gods seriously. There is clearly a movement from gods to heroes to mere men, men who are human, all too human. You can see it right through the history of Greek art in particular. Right? And if you go back to Homer, you can hook that up as being the earlier phase, still symbolic, still referring back to the gods. And if you move on beyond Euripides, what are you going to get? Aristophanes and the development of comedy? That's human, all too human. We get a gradual reduction in our self-conception from these myths to ourself. And now Hegel is going to move us up in the opposite direction so that we can come to know ourselves as we really are. The final development of art is romantic art. And the reason why romantic art is important is because it, what it does is absorb the Christian emphasis on the self and the importance of the individual. And by absorbing that Christian emphasis on the self and the significance of the individual, consider any of Goethe's works as the best example of that. Um, what he says is that this is the next phase in the development of human self-consciousness. And that these phases are necessary. You cannot have this important conce this conception of the self represented in art until you get these earlier necessary phases. It's like climbing the rungs of a ladder. So that's art as the first phase in the development of absolute spirit. The second phase is religion. Now, why religion is different from art, because religion is just the, se uh, the sensuous representation of the form of, of the world, of reality. Religion is a sort of pictorial representation of reality. In other words, the reason why Jesus teaches in parables is because it is an attempt not to be logically rigorous. It is an attempt to give you a picture of what virtue is. And it is the most accessible to people who don't spend all their time in the library the way Hegel did. So clearly, this is a necessary precondition to creating a philosophical culture which will allow for the construction of something like Hegel's phenomenology of Geist. So, Religion is a pictorial, kind of a primitive representation of true geistlich self-knowledge. And it develops from primitive nature worship to the highest religion in uh, Hegel's view, which is Christianity, which is, the Christi which is the religion in which Geist is made universal, but still represented in pictures. And the good, a good uh, analogy, or a good way to think about this movement from pictorial, religious understanding of the Geist and the true non-pictorial, direct apprehension of the Geist is something like a uh, the golden rule. In the Gospels, you will find that in more than one place, Jesus enjoins us to follow the golden rule, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And he gives it in various kinds of nice parables. It takes the, you know, the, the form of, say, the things like the Beatitudes, or the various parables that we see in the Gospel, where it explains that you ought to love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's a very kind of primitive and metaphorical way, poetic way of talking about this. It is not unreasonable to describe Kant's categorical imperative as the golden rule dressed up in its logical Sunday best. Right? In other words, the idea of it, the content of it is no different at all. If you go and look at the categorical imperative, what it tells you is act such that you could will that the maximum of your action should become a universal law of nature, which it says treat other people like you want to be treated. It's more Jesus. The difference is that this is not represented in parables. This is organized in a directly logical, cognitive way. The difference between religion and philosophy is not what we understand, but rather how we understand it. Religion is pictorial, symbolic, metaphorical, representative, direct, logical, reasonable apprehension. Geistlich uh, apprehension is philosophy. That's why it's the final stage in the human apprehension of itself. Now, there are many, many consequences and implications to this set of doctrines, and I can't do justice to the significance of Hegelian philosophy, or even just the, the phenomenology of Geist in one lecture. But one topic that is worthy of consideration because of its subsequent importance for the history of philosophy is how we are to read this, what we are to think about this business. Because at the end of Hegel's phenomenology of Geist, he says that the Geist coming to self-consciousness in phenomenology, in philosophy, in this book, is what he called the Golgotha of absolute spirit. 
For those of you who are not familiar with the term Golgotha, it is the place where Jesus gets crucified, right? It is the point at which heaven connects to earth. Now the difficulty here is that this is ambiguous, perhaps intentionally ambiguous, but I think it's just Hegel being Hegel. Right? In other words, I don't think most of these ambiguities are intentional. It's just that he's got to fire this off and he doesn't know how to write sentences that are less than 100 words. So I'm inclined to say that the fact that this has been read in two diametrically different ways is something we have to live with. It's basic to this kind of understanding of the world. And we don't know that if this, I mean, if this, is, if this book, at the end of the philosophy, or the phenomenology of Geist, if it is the Golgotha of absolute spirit, does that mean it's the death of God? Does that mean it's the death of absolute spirit? Or does that mean it's the end of the finitude of absolute spirit? And that means it becomes infinite. And rather than dead, it becomes perfected. In other words, is this the vindication of religion? Or is this the abolition of religion? It's not clear. Not only is it not clear, but Hegel says some very peculiar things. Left wing, the, what we call the left wing, or young Hegelian reading, treats Hegel as an atheist. They emphasize the phenomenology as opposed to the logic and the encyclopedia, and they hold on to the idea of dialectic and change, and they particularly make use of Hegel's statement that God is dead. Now it may surprise you that Nietzsche did not introduce that into Western philosophy. Hegel thought that up. I think that, Hegel never, that Nietzsche never forgave him. But he actually said that God is dead, but that doesn't mean that he's an atheist. Hegel also said, I am a Lutheran. Right? And, well, that's enigmatic. How are we supposed to think about that? Well, you might want to finesse the idea of God being dead, saying, well, what that means, what dead means is that we move from the symbol to our rational cognitive understanding. In other words, we've gone beyond religion, but we sublated it. We preserved the essence, the core of religion, and gave it a more satisfactory logical form. That's the right-wing reading. I mean, in other words, that's the sense in which he Hegel could be called a Lutheran. You could treat God is dead as meaning God is dead, and what happens then in the course of history is not the ultimate reconciliation of God and man, the connection of our finite minds to the infinite, perfect, non-contradictory mind. It could be seen as human beings' loss of alienation that got introduced in the master-slave dialectic. In other words, the end of history then might be read in an atheistic way at the end of the phenomenology as saying what happens is not a reconciliation of God and man, but a reconciliation of man and himself that had been alienated from the earliest point in which Herrschaft, in which domination and the master and slave dialectic emerges. So we have always been partial and incomplete and finite in our understanding. The end of this understanding is an infinite, final, complete understanding of ourselves because after all there's nothing else to understand. This can be seen as a reconciliation of God and man. If that's the case, then that means that this is logically analogous to the book of the Apocalypse. It's the end of the world. If it is seen as being not a logical apocalypse, but as a strictly atheistic, this-worldly view, then what it means is that human beings finally have become, or human being finally is. We are no longer the fragmented, disjointed horror that human history discloses us to be. It is not clear which one of these is true. I leave it to your reading to try and figure out how to, to negotiate this maze. I would say, in closing, both of these readings are persuasive and both of these readings are important. I am inclined to think that Hegel was in fact a religious believer and was in fact a Lutheran and in fact meant this to indicate a sort of logical apocalypse, the reconciliation of God and man. I think that while that is probably closer to Hegel's actual intentions insofar as I'm able to discern them at all, um, I would say that it hasn't been the most fruitful reading. In other words, sometimes misreadings can be very useful and very thoughtful. And I think that the left-wing misreading, uh, the treatment of this as an atheistic system, I think that's been extra extraordinarily fruitful. This is certainly Marx's favorite part of Hegel, right? Because that means that this dialectic in master, of master and slave is the origin of domination, Herrschaft, hierarchy, and that means alienation. And then he'll read the reconciliation of God and man, the elimination of alienation, as being the telos of history the global proletarian revolution. It makes a certain amount of sense. The reason why ultimately we can't, or we, we can't come to any final answer as to how we're supposed to interpret the phenomenology, whether we are supposed to interpret the, uh, the Geist's self-understanding and the, the Geist coming to self-knowledge as either a theistic or an atheistic proposition is because, as Wilhelm Dilthey said at the end of the 19th century, the generation that could read Hegel is dead.